means we are delighted to host today Matthias Troyer, leading the group of uh, quantum computing and quantum technology at, uh, at Microsoft. Most, I mean, every one of us will know Matthias, I'm sure, uh, who was former uh, professor at ETH Zurich, has been leading the field of computational commons matter uh, with uh, a list of distinctions too long to summarize here, but recently the Hamburg Prize for Commons Matter in particular. Oh, so yeah, thank you for the, 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 the invitation. I would love to be, be in London in person. Unfortunately, we can't do it now, but I hope to, to, to come next year. And I want to start out by, by saying, kind of, why did I join Microsoft and why did I, I move, move from the contents of metaphysics to quantum computing? The reason I think goes back to my mega master's thesis, where the topic had been to perform a mega quantum Monte Carlo logic simulation to solve the TJ model or the Hubbard model, we quickly find out there's this sign problem that stops us from that. And the, the, the sign problem has been, been like a, haunting me for decades. And I then got to the, 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 the point where I said, you know, to really make progress, I would love to have the quantum computer. And when Microsoft offered me the choice to join them and have built one, then I stepped on board there. And the basic idea and why it's exciting is the new physics always leads to new technologies. Thermodynamics had led to the, 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 the steam engine and the industrial revolution. Electromagnetism led to electronics, cell phones, classical computers. And quantum physics is new and will be the next big change. In technology, we know it since a century and more, but we still, I think, have not reached the end of what we can do with quantum computing. And why it's exciting is that basically the classical computers we have now work on the same principle as uh, the the abacus. From the millennia ago, it's still the same type of classical digital computing with quantum computing with quantum bits. We change that because we can start and compute in the quantum superpositions, and that will be a change in the way we compute. I want to talk today about how can we use it to solve problems that we cannot solve classically. And you can start out by saying, let me just solve a quantum problem on the computer. Let me just, just simulate a quantum computer on a classical one. And if I have a single quantum bit, that's just a, 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 a quantum, this been one half, it can be up or down, say, or one, uh, two states in the, 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 the Hilbert space. But then as I increase the number of qubits or the number of the quantum spins, the memory I need to store the wave function, of course, increases exponentially with the number of qubits. So for two qubits, I have four states in the, 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 the Hilbert space. For three qubits, I have eight states. When I have 20 qubits, it's, uh, it's uh, about, uh, about maybe one million states. I need roughly 16 megabytes to store the wave function. I could, in principle, simulate uh, the 20 qubit here quantum computer on my cell phone. When I go to 30 qubits, it's a billion states. And 
need me a 16, uh, the 53 gigabyte, I can use my laptop. When I go to 40 qubits, I need a big machine. When I go to 50 qubits, I need 16 petabytes of memory. And that's what maybe the next generation big supercomputer could solve. When I go to 60 qubits, I may have to wait a decade. But when you go to 250 qubits, then I know that the size of the Nehiba space is more than there are, there are the, the, the atoms in the visible the, 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 the universe. And so which we simply cannot build a classical computer to simulate a quantum computer with 250 qubits or more. And so that offers the chance to use those qubits, the, the, the quantum computer, to solve problems that are hard. Because just solving, to, just like simulating 250 qubits might not be exciting, but we can use it to solve problems. And one example of a problem that you can solve with a few thousand qubits is the RSA challenge. Find the prime factors of this number. This number was obtained by multiplying two prime numbers. That was easy. The task now is to find out what the prime numbers were. And that is something that no classical computer we have can do. We, we just don't know that. But once you know it, then it's easy to check. So to find out what those prime factors are, a classical computer, the biggest one we could build, would take about a billion years. Now you can make it a bit faster, the machine, then it might only take, take maybe 100 million years, but it's still a long time. When in a quantum computer, once I have one with a few thousand qubits, I could, can solve the same problem in a matter of days. And that's a game changer. So I can basically do problems, I can solve problems that are classically intractable. But now factoring numbers is not that exciting. And the real question thus becomes, what do we actually want to do once we have the quantum computer? And when I ask my colleagues and I started asking them about, about, uh, the, 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 about, the, about, the, about 10 years ago, I was okay, what could we do? What should we do once we have a quantum computer? Why should we build one? What's the reason? And I heard many things. I heard people tell me we can use it to make better drugs, to counter climate change, to cure cancer for proteins. I've been told we can use it to, to fight hunger, yeah, to get, to eradicate disease, to get, to get to better batteries, to better AI, and so on. I got a huge list of problems that you can solve with the, 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 the quantum computer. When I started asking the question, how would we do it? How would we use the quantum computer to actually cure cancer? Or how can it really help in folding proteins? Then the answers got very vague. And I realized many times that this is a list for a quantum wishing well. These are all super interesting hard problems where we wished we had a machine that can solve them. And the next step is now faced with many <laughs> interesting problems. Actually, how could we use the quantum computer to solve them? Which ones will be, be ones we do immediately once we have one? Which ones might take something a bit bigger? Which ones are good for quantum? Which ones are not? And so we need to dig deeper and learn how we can use quantum computers to solve certain problems and find out where they're good. And the starting point I've been told is, yes, there is a list. The, 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 the quantum algorithm Zoo maintained by Stephen Jordan, who joined the Microsoft of the team three years back, and he maintains a list of all the known quantum algorithms with quantum speeder. So the negative algorithm where we know that they scale better than a classical algorithm for the same problem. And so we can go there, we can pick out an algorithm and apply it to a problem. But when you do that, there are a few things 
to consider. One is IO. For example, there's Grover's algorithm. And uh, that's one of the most famous quantum algorithm and is called a negative database search algorithm. And the statement basically is, if you have an unsorted database, let's say a phone book, and I have to have a number, I want to, to find the name, then on a classical computer, I have to really read the phone book from A to C to find that number. So I have to look at every single entry. So when there are, there are negative N entries, I need to really load N entries from the phone book. But when you have a quantum computer, then it can be accelerated because I only have to look at the phone book square root of N times. So there's a scaling advantage, there's a quantum speed up. And that is wonderful at the complexity theory level. But when you look at it in practice and you have your phone book here, then you have to load the phone book also into the quantum computer. And as you load the phone book into the machine, you can just search for the number and you find it. The first time you load it, you found the number. On the quantum computer, you also have to load the phone book at least once. And in this case, it's actually worse. Namely, I need to look at the phone book classically n times. n times I look at one number. Quantum mechanically, I go in with a quantum superposition of all names. That means each time I look at the phone book, I have to look at all names and all numbers. And so I look at the phone book only squared of n times, but each time I'm looking at the entire phone book. So I have to load the entire phone book square root of n times. And actually the problem of complexity has become square root of times worse because classically I only need to load it once. And that is a problem that is often ignored how do I get the data into the quantum computer? And thus, I'm saying that quantum computers are good for the big compute, compute problems on small data, and not for big data problems. And so where are these big compute problems on small data? And one problem are quantum systems, chemistry, material science. Because there, I need a few numbers to describe the molecule, to describe the material, but the wave function is exponentially large in the number of orbitals. Machine learning is something hard. Optimization are hard. These are, are, are negative to all problems where there are exponentially many configurations. So where you have 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 uh, where you have small data describing the problem, but exponentially many configurations, and that's where the quantum computers can help because loading the problem is easy, solving the problem is hard. And I want to focus today on problems in chemistry and in material science. And then, if you want to solve a chemistry problem exactly on a computer, then, uh, then a small molecule, molecule like caffeine or something can be solved accurately, can find the ground state, state, state with a chemical accuracy easily on a classical computer. But as I go to, to a big molecule, like the nigga, I get a cofactor of the FEMOCO that is so correlated that I cannot accurately get the ground state of the electronic structure of the molecule on a classical computer. Why is that problem interesting? That's interesting for the problem of of adapted nitrogen fixation. We currently use fertilizer intensively on our fields, but in the past, before we had that 
uh, uh, that uh, that nigga uh, one used nigga uh, the, the crop rotation. The, every year, few years, one planted legumes on the field, and the reason for for that is that in the root system of legumes there are microbes that have have. And enzyme the which I show here, that can take nitrogen from the air and turn it into to negative ammonia, which forms the basis of nitrogen based fertilizers. And so basically, that enzyme here can make fertilizer, can turn nitrogen from the air into ammonia. And we would love to understand how it does that, because, because if we understand the process here, that could allow us to find a, a better and cheaper way of making fertilizer. Now, unfortunately, the active core of this this Fimoco molecule is so complex that I cannot accurately simulate it classically. But if I had a quantum computer, I could. And there are more problems where I would like to to, to understand how a certain catalytic reaction works. For example, I would like to find a catalyst for a carbon fixation. If we could just find a catalyst that can efficiently take the CO2 from the air and turn it into, let's say, methanol, then it would be very interesting to help us solve for, for, for the global warming. So there are many problems like that where we want to find a new catalyst. And what is the problem in finding a catalyst? I have to really understand the reaction network, the reaction mechanism. I start with the with the carbon dioxide. Side, side, side molecule reacting with the catalyst, going through stages and steps. And then I end up with methanol, and the catalyst is free to capture the next CO2 molecule. But there are many more directions the reaction could go. And they need to, to find one that really makes just this cycle beautifully well. And for that, we, we want to design it. And if you want to predict it, I have to understand the energies of all the intermediate states because the reaction rate depends exponentially on the energy difference between the initial state and the, the near transition state. And so to predict how a reaction goes here, to predict how the, the, the catalysts work, I have to calculate the energies of many of those 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 transition states. And in many cases, we don't have the classical algorithm to calculate the energies with sufficient accuracy. So what we would us like to do is we want to look at a way of exploring the catalysis. We want to look at your many different structures. We want to find the intermediate states. And then when I found the ones that are interesting and relevant, once I've optimized the structure, then I want to extract the, the effect if you have a Hamiltonian for the negative active space of the catalyst. And then I want to solve that problem. And quite often that is not possible 
accurately enough classically. And so that's where we here on uh, ah, the right, I would love to use the quantum hardware in the future. And then once I have the energies, I calculate the negative free energies and use it to understand the, the reaction here mechanism. Or I may use something like that to find a new material, a new magnet, a new 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 supercomputer, the superconductor. There are many problems where we want to solve quantum problems in chemistry or 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 material science better than I can do classically. And so the question is, how do we actually solve a quantum problem? And the answer is, it shouldn't be that hard in principle, because we know the theory of almost uh, most uh, ever, ever, uh, I think according to 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 the Laughlin and Pines, we know the equations that describe molecules and materials. It's just to the the Nigel Schrodinger equation with Coulomb interactions. So we know the problem we want to solve, and it is a linear partial differential equation. So in principle, is easy mathematically, but it lives in a three and dimensions, and that makes it hard. So because we cannot really solve a problem in 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 in, 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 in the three dimensions, the breakthrough in, in simulating materials and molecules came came with 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 the density functional theory that effectively maps the 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 problem that lived in three dimensions where the wave function is a function of your three and variables to the density just that lives in three dimensions that becomes tractable. And for many problems, like here I show the band structure of silicon, we can actually solve the problem. We can get the band gap nicely for many materials that the weakly correlated, it works well. We have the classical methods to solve them. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, many of you work on. But when you go too strongly, correlated materials that starts to, to break down, one example are the cupretia high temperature superconductors. They are, 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 are exciting materials. We'd like to understand why do they, they superconduct. We'd love to design some new ones with and the higher transition temperature. But when, when we simulate them with simple density function theory, then we find that the predictions are even qualitatively wrong. EFT will tell you the 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 negative the negative materials should be 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 the metals in real in in reality they are negative insulators so things break down and we can't answer the question what their, 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 their negative properties are, but we would love to understand why are they superconducting and could we maybe find a room temperature superconductor? The reason why that is hard that when you have a, 
and to, to correlate it to a quantum system, then solving that exactly is of exponential complexity on classical computers. Because if when you want to use exact that diagonalization, uh, then the Hilbert space dimension grows exponentially with number of particles. The, the Monte Carlo has the same problem. Those people who, who you use use the methods like the 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 the, the density matrix renormalization method know also that if things things are entangled, then it gets exponentially hard. So it seems that solving the quantum problem exactly is exponentially hard in general. But then you also know that nature can do it. When you look at a leaf calculating the color that is green, calculating that is very hard, but the leaf is just green by itself. The superconductor just superconducts. And the reason is that nature is intrinsically quantum. So nature knows the materials properties and the materials can have them because they're based on quantum principles. And so Neil Feynman proposed that if you want to understand it, then we should build a computer that also uses quantum principles and not a classical one. And that now Neil, for, for 40 years back was the start of your quantum computing, the idea that we should build a quantum machine, uh, the quantum computer, to solve quantum problems in chemistry, material science, in quantum physics. And that's, that was kind of the kickoff for the quantum computing. But the first devices that were built were analog ones. Because it is easy always to build something analog, something that just works based on the principles that, uh, that you build something special purpose. And in this case, to solve quantum problems, we can just build a quantum model with a, 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 like two, two nigga, quality of quantum Legos in the lab. For example, we can build a, a uh, simulator for quantum systems based on uh, uh, ultra cold, uh, cold at atomic quantum gases. In this case, uh, so the atoms trapped in uh, the, the, the uh, standing uh, waves of, 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 of lasers that is the, they are described by uh, the, the, the quantum model. And then if you run the uh, the so experiment on the system, then you measure properties of the quantum model that you can build, where you can, can you give tune the parameters, the hopping term, the repulsion and so on. So you have a tunable simulator for quantum model and can use that to solve a quantum problem that is classically hard. But before you want to solve the hard one, you want to solve one that you can st still do to, to, to classically. And so with, uh, with my, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, to, 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 to take it back, we looked at bosons and wanted to solve the, 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 the Hubbard model of bosons with quantum hardware and classically and bosonic atoms I, 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 I can simulate. And so we I, simulated it classically. We ran it on the, I, the, the, the quantum simulator. We measured here, the, here the, 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 the moment some this three fusion a function as a, a function of your temperature. The back row is uh, the neoclassically assisted simulation, the front row, the quantum ones, the data uh, uh, decrease beautifully. And as you cool down, you see the, the yes, secondary 
peak grow here, that is the onset where the near boson zones condense. So it works beautifully. You get the right physics out. Those machines work. We never validated them. Now, bosons is an easy problem because bosons we can solve by quantum Monte Carlo methods. But you can run the, the same experiments with fermions, with quantum spins. You can look at the excited states that are hard, transport properties, so the, the, the non equilibrium problems. So there are many problems that we can solve in the, those, those, those experiments that are hard classically. And so there are many interesting quantum physics problems to be solved on quantum simulators. But quantum simulators, great as they are, have limitations. And the limitations come to the, from the fact that they are analog devices. And, this devi and the limitations are general to anything analog, classical or quantum. Because when you build something analog, then you build a special purpose device to solve a certain problem and you can only solve a certain class of problems. And And so they are limited to just uh, just uh, certain problems. Then, when it's analog, it is hard to calibrate. How well do I know the temperature? How well do I know the the the, the couplings? There are limitations to how well I can specify the problem. How well I I get. get uh, I can measure that. And there are limitations to how far I can cool. For example, when I take a Hubbard model to describe a superconductor, then when it's like repulsive interactions, they can cool it maybe to the point where the model turns magnetic, thick when it's undoped, but we are still far above the temperature that I would need to reach to understand the superconductivity in those models. So great as they are, and block quantum simulators does uh, the, the have limitations. And that is not just specific to quantum, it's the same in classical. The first classical computers were in the analog. We moved to digital ones because of the same reasons. The, 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 the calibration errors, limitations to scalability, the, 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 the limitations to just, uh, just the, just the specific problems. And so we want to take the same step here and we need to move from the analog to the programmable digital quantum computer and that will then solve these problems. So I want to next talk about how would you then use a programmable digital quantum computer to solve, uh, solve an interesting problem in chemistry or in material science. And I want to start the discussion by thinking about how to actually solve these problems on a classical computer. On a classical computer, let's say I want the ground state of a quantum system. One thing I can do is I can take a trial state that could be closed and I can project it in imaginary time down to the true ground state. We can take a neutral state and I multiply it many times with the 
you have the, the Hamiltonian together with the ground state in a negative iterative eigensolver. There's always essentially, in the end, a projection in imaginary time onto the ground state. And that works well classically, but the memory I need is exponential to store the wave function, or if I use, use, New York, use New York quantum the the color methods, then the, the, the runtime is long. Now, on a quantum computer, I have the big advantage that storing the wave function is easy. I don't need much memory. But I'm limited in the operations because the quantum computer operates on quantum principles. And so I cannot do imaginary time projection. The only thing I can do in a quantum system is unitary operations and I can do measurements. So I'm quite limited in the operation compared to what I could do classically. I, I gain a lot by not needing the memory to store the wave function because the qubits will be in the right wave function, but the algorithms are limited in what I can do. So how can I now find an eigenstate or how can I find the ground state on a quantum computer? And the idea is a bit different than classically, but the, the idea is I would also start from a trial state that I hope would be close to the ground state, for example. And then what I do is I projectively measure the energy of the state. And we know that when I measure the energy of a quantum system, then it collapses to an eigenstate. So then I get to, to, to get out the, the, out the, 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 one of the, the, the eigenstates and the energy. So if the trial state I start with has a big negative overlap with the ground state, then with the uh, uh, high probability, when I measure the energy, I got to, 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 to collapse onto the ground state, then I have the ground state energy and I have the ground state wave function exactly. So that's the good news, I can actually get the exact ground states, I can get exact eigenstates and the energies. But how do I do that? How do I measure the energy? I can't just measure each term separately, because if I measure each term separately, then I the, 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 the collapse onto an eigenstate of that term that I've measured. So I have to be able to measure the total system energy. And that way, 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 project onto an eigenstate of the total Hamiltonian. And the way to do that is with quantum phase estimation. And the basic idea here is when you start from an eigenstate, phi n here, and if I evolve it in time under the, 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 the Hamiltonian, then I pick up a phase. And that phase is proportional to, to the energy of the state times the time. So when I have an eigenstate and I evolve in time, then I just pick up a phase. And if I can measure the phase, then from the phase and the time I evolve, I can calculate the energy. If I don't start from an eigenstate and I measure the phase, then it will project onto one of the eigenstates. So all I have to do is measure the phase of the wave function of the time evolution. But we know that the phase cannot be observed. But what we can do is we can do inter, 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 inter field experiments, we can measure relative phases. And so the idea here is basically I virtually in my program set up an inter experiment. I add one extra quantum bit here to 
the, the, the system, then I put this extra quantum bit into a, 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 a superposition of the, 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 the zero and one. And what I then do is I say, I evolve the state, but I evolve the state only if this extra qubit is in the state one. And they don't touch the wave function when it's in the state zero. So I evolve it controlled by the extra qubit. And that means after a while, when evolved it, when it's zero, nothing changed. When it's one, I evolve it. So when it's zero, there's no change. When it's one, it picks up a face. So now that extra qubit that used to be in the state, uh, state like zero row, row plus one goes into the state zero plus the phase factor times one. And if I measure the state of this extra qubit, then from that state, I can actually extract the phase. So I evolve the system controlled by an extra qubit. Then I measure that qubit. I measure the phase. As I measure the phase, the wave function collapses to the eigenstate. The phase gives me the energy and from the, 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 the wave function, I can, can measure yeah, but the, the properties of the state. So what we need to do, the only thing we need to do is we need to be able to evolve a quantum system on the, 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 uh, the Hamiltonian. And so we want to uh, simulate the system or the, 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 the term of your the, the fermions on a uh, uh, quantum computer. And the way we do that is very easy in a second quantized picture. I just map the occupations of some site to a qubit. The upstate of the qubit is zero, is the empty site, one is filled. There can be a And so I use, uh, you, use a to one qubit per spin orbital. Then if you want to measure the occupation number, that's 01, I can, 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 can like map it easily to a like poly C measurement on the qubit. If you want to evolve it, with a term, then have to map the the negative terms to quantum spins because qubits are quantum spins, and then I can do with the standard Gottenberg-Wigner transformation. I want to to evolve under a term that has here here negative sigma the plus operator. The, 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 something like sigma c's to calculate the the the, the, the minus signs and then like a sigma ma, ma, like a minus the operator for the like creation operator. So I can just map the fermions to spins, and once I have spins, I can map it to my qubits, which are basically quantum spins. And then I can write down a quantum program, a quantum circuit to evolve for a time step under this term. So for each term, I can find a way to propagate the state with that term. If I then look at the negative, when I but look at the general negative n-body problem. There are quadratic terms, the quartic terms, the big number of them, n to the four ones in general for a Coulomb problem. And I evolve with that by evolving a small time step with each of the terms. So use a standard diatrotter, the negative decomposition. I split my time into many 
small time steps and evolve with each of the terms separately, just as we do it in a classical code. And for each of these terms, I have efficient quantum circuits to do it. And from the standpoint of somebody in complexity theory, they say we have succeeded because a quantum problem with n orbitals has so, so, so the, it's got, it's got the n to the four terms. For each term, I can write down uh, 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 the, the quantum circuit that uses only a, a, a polynomial number of gates. And so with a runtime, this case with the power of the near system size, I can time evolve the quantum system. But classically, it would take me extra exponential time. So for the, the, the complexity theorists, they call it success because we can do it with exponential quantum speed up. But I want to go a step further. I don't just want to prove that I can do it exponentially better than on a classical computer. I actually want to solve a problem. And so we looked at the problem of the negative moco, the cofactor in negative chain fixation which is a problem of 65 electrons in roughly 50 orbitals. This is beyond what we can solve classically, but it's just a little bit beyond. So it's one of the easiest problems to start with. And we wrote the code and we estimated how much time it would take me to run the problem if I had a thousand qubit quantum computer. And what I found is that if I can do one of the, 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 the negate operations in 100 year nanoseconds, then the runtime would be about 300,000 years. And with that, I would say, despite the exponential speed up, we have a problem because I cannot wait 300,000 years to get the answer. And the reason why it takes so long is when I look at that and I count the number of gates, I need to do about 10 to the 18 operations. And what we had to do then is we don't give up, but we say, hey, we know the problem. You know the problem also. So, so, so from, from the classical computing. When you first write a code, it's so slow, you have to, to optimize it. So we spent three years optimizing the algorithm. We reused results, which gave us the negative uh, factor N. We reorder the code to make it get parallel. And we got a factor four here and 10 there and so on. And so with kind of five, six different ideas to make the code run faster, we could get the runtime down by a factor of, uh, of, of 10 million so that it could run in a couple of weeks on that machine with uh, 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 get time of your 100 nanoseconds. So we showed that once we have, 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 have a machine, and we can solve the, solve, 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 solve near certain classically intractable problems. What we also found is that it is really important to optimize the codes, just like classically. So we need people who start working king on your on the quantum software. We not only have to think about the algorithm, we have to implement it, optimize it, improve it to make things feasible. And that's why, uh, why we, we invented 
ne programmier language ja t t t q sharp compilers simulators the people can get get me started writing a quantum code improving it thinking about problems so that was a simple problem in chemistry one of the first ones that are classically hard but let me go back now to the 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 superconductor now it's not just not just like 60, 60 orbitals, but it may be about 50 orbitals per unit cell. And if you want to, 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 to study the, 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 the material, I may need to, to, to look at the, 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 the from hundreds of unit cells. Then, the, the total number per, per the, the orbital might be thousands. And then the runtime, even of the faster quantum algorithm will be more than the age of the universe. And I really don't have the time to wait that long. So what we have to do now, then is what we do now also, we have to reduce it to simplify effective models. For example, starting from the the the, the 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 material look at the, the crystal structure we find that the negative cup rates are planar we identify the the the, the active yeah, the, the, the orbitals and extract uh, 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 the uh simply the 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 the, 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 the model like the, the, the Hubbard model, and then that we can solve in minutes. So to, to use quantum computers for materials, it is not just that we brute force just use it. We put it on, we solve it, it runs, it's done. That will not work. The scaling is too bad. That, that is just far too complex. We need to do essentially the same approaches we do now when we look at the uh, 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 strongly system. We take the material, we extract uh, uh, the simply fight effective model that we can then solve much better than classically on the, the the quantum hardware and that result we we feed back into the the, 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 the full simulation so where quantum can help is it will change the way we do things we can do ground states of models with a thousand of sites we can solve the the sign problem in the qmc simulations it is very easy to get, get, uh, get access to, to, to quantum dynamics, but it's not just that the machine will do it. We still need people like you who, 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 who the, the, the work on your simulations. You just get a new tool to help you with uh, the, 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 the work you do. And we can start now. I am the, the mentioned the, the, the simulators, the compilers, the, 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 the programming languages. We have the, the, them, them for, for, for the download. They are, are, are the open source. We are so, so have the, the, the cloud services up. You can play with the, 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 with the noise, the, the quantum hardware there. So it's time now to start thinking about 
how we'll use quantum hardware in the future to solve the problems we have today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this very exciting uh, and uh, interesting talk. Uh, we, we will now start taking questions from the audience. Um, so do, please do raise your hand or uh, put a message in the chat uh, if you want to ask a question. Uh, while people are gathering their thoughts, Matthias, uh, maybe I can start shooting a first question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the cuprates uh, in your talk. I yeah. was wondering, um, you know, we did accumulate some knowledge uh, from the physics uh, on these materials. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if some of this information could actually be used to guide and design the quantum algorithm themselves. You did touch a little bit upon in your talk. I was yeah. wondering if you had any more insights. Uh, yes, so that's a great question because I've heard people worry once we have the content created, do we need still need people like you are, like I was and others who worked hard on those systems? Will it just be will we just be replaced? And if we still still need people in content in metaphysics, or will the machine just replace us? And the answer is no, we will not be replaced, we will be more important. We we just get better tools. Because let's think, for example, about the coup rates, and let's the, or let's say we want to solve the the, the nuclear Hubbard model. What I can do on the quantum with this, given some starting state, I can time evolve it. That doesn't solve the problem because I don't know which state to start from. That doesn't give you the ground state. And then, but so I need to find a way of actually preparing the ground state. I can do it by by maybe simulating cooling. Or I can do it in this case by saying, let me get a good mean field theory for it. Let me start with the mean field ground state that I have in the mean field model, and let me then adiabatically change the, the Hamiltonian from the mean field one to the full one. And that way I get a good trial state to then start from, because I need the good trial state for the ground state. And that comes from intuition, from the, the, the 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 knowledge you have you need to have some way of getting the trial state and so that's where all your knowledge intuition comes in but then when you have that then the quantum machine will help you to project from there to the to ground state and then if you don't know which is the right mean field starting point then you try multiple ones and see which one gives you the better state so we need uh, the the intuition here to guide us in the use and the machine will, will then be a tool to refine it and to help you improve the answers. It's the same in chemistry. We can't just do it brute force. We can have to think through it and kind of what we want to do with these small machines that will be rare initially. Um, uh, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, I, I'm just following with the list of questions. So Joel Plasson had a question. Would you like Joel maybe to ask your question directly, maybe? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, I'm just, uh, oh, let me turn on my camera. I I'm just uh, curious about um, if you can say more, go into more detail about the, the, the move you made from end of the four terms in the quartic Hamiltonian to end terms in the Hamiltonian. Yes. So that is the map, so the, so, with n to the four terms, it cannot go to 1,000 because the runtime is just bad. The scaling of that type is bad. What I mentioned here is if I want to understand the Cupress, for example, then I can simplify the model to make the Hubbard model. And the Hubbard model, where I assume that the Coulomb interaction is clean, the long distance becomes linear, O n. Now, of course, the question is, is that model good enough? We'll have to see it by comparing to nature. And so we can solve it first, and then we see, hey, it's not good enough, and we add more terms, and we make it more complex to find out what is the right way of doing it. But then, mm -hmm. also in chemistry, there are linear scaling methods where you have to have a, 
uh, like a systematic way to find approximations and, and, and like a form um, relations which for 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 like a localizes that terms terms may become linear. But then typically the, the scaling becomes linear at the size of thousands of orbitals, and we can't even go to that scale here. So here I meant let's go to simplified models, let's study those, let's learn from those. And with the insights we get from that, we could find, I think ultimately my vision is that with the insights we gain from simplified models here, we'll find better ways of getting approximate classical methods that we can then apply at scale. So use the quantum machine to improve and calibrate the approximations, getting better functionals and then. Thanks. Um, but there's quite a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, I, I might just address first the technical one um, and then move back to the more general yeah. questions. So there was a question from uh, um, George. Uh, George, would you like to, to jump on? Sure, yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you, Matthias, so much uh, for a really interesting talk. Uh, yeah, this is a, a, a little bit of a, a technical question. Um, you presented the quantum phase estimation as the algorithm to get the, the ground yes. state of an electronic problem. Um, and, you know, as you'll be well aware that, that the approach that's been used on the kind of limited quantum computers to date uh, yes. has been the variational uh, quantum eigensolver where you have an ansatz and, and you try and yes. optimize that ansatz with, with classical resources. Um, I was just wondering for your perspective on, on the long-term future of that algorithm. Is that algorithm Great in question. the near term going to be consigned to nothing more than a kind of historical curiosity? Or, or do you think this is going to be a standard algorithm, this, this kind of hybrid quantum classical approach, a standard algorithm for these, uh, for these computers sort of going forward in the longer term? Yes. So that is a great question that, that I love because we, we looked at that. And so the, the, the like variational quantum solver is great for demonstrations so that we can do something today. Basically, we prepare uh, 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 wave function on some noise the the, 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 the quantum hardware we, we can do it now with few qubits with a noisy and we can do beautiful demonstrations the question is will it scale to the point where this interesting where it solves a problem that it cannot solve Classically, right? That's the goal. Because if I can do it classically, then there's no use building quantum hardware. I want to solve problems that I cannot solve classically. And for that, I need to go to problems with at least like 50 to 70, 100 Britney spin orbitals. And when I get to that, and the variational wave function I prepare with the quantum hardware, has to be better than the best variation wave function I can do classically, right? It has to be accurate enough. And there the problem becomes, if you want to apply to the Coulomb problem, the number of terms grows. It grows with the, the fourth power. So you have to measure about 100 to the four terms to chemical accuracy. And if you then calculate, so, and when it's just a few terms you measure, then it's easy. But the scaling is bad. And when you then want to look at a molecule like we did, and you, 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 you estimate what is the accuracy you need, then you find you need to do about 10 to the 10 measurements to evaluate the energy. Now, if one repetition takes a millisecond of the experiment, that is a year of runtime to evaluate one energy. That's one problem. As you scale up, the runtimes grow faster, and the runtimes grow faster than, than with the phase estimation. But you could still think, hey, but I can do it with noisy hardware. So let's me just build many machines that are noisy. 
but then you need to get an ansatz wave function at the scale of 100 qubits that is competitive with the best classical one. And, and what people showed is that you need to run at least 100,000 quantum gates to prepare those wave functions at that scale. And when you have, have noisy quantum gates, then the results will just be too noisy. So the problem is when you scale to the size where it gets interesting, you have to start using the logical qubit for tolerance. You need a big machine and the runtimes are large. And once you get to the fault tolerant machines, then quantum phase estimation is the better algorithm than VQE. So the short answer is for small demos, VQE is great. As you scale it up to the interesting problem sizes, you need logical qubits. And then the phase estimation is the better scaling algorithm. And so I'd say it's the second thing that you mentioned that namely it will become a curiosity. It, it was used for the first demos. It's not what will ultimately be used. Excellent, thanks a lot. Um, uh, next in line, we have Daniel uh, Shepard. Would you like to, uh, to jump on, Daniel? If Daniel is not, I can just maybe read the question. So the question is, does nature appear to deploy algorithm with significant run times that might correspond to non-trivial circuit depth? Oh, yes. And we know that because we know there are certain quantum, because we know that finding, for example, the ground state of the quantum problem is in general exponentially hard, even on quantum hardware. So just take a glass and cool it down. It takes forever. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Um, Lucas, uh, would you like to jump on with your question? Lucas Wagner. Again, if Lucas is muted, um, I might just read the question again. Um, so thank you for the very nice talk, Matthias. You mentioned that computing effective models would be an important way forward. Are you working on this problem? Any thoughts for going forward on that? I'm currently not working on that really because we need to build the machine first, but I say this I think will be, be, be something very important. How do I actually get the quantitative the, 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 the reliable defective model, which method can you use for embedding, for downfolding and so on. So what are the ways of how we can extract the effective model that is accurate. Because the challenge is if I can use the quantum computer to exactly solve an effective model, but in deriving the effective model, I make like uncontrolled errors, then why do I care that I can solve that model accurately? So it will be really important to use quantum computer. It will be really important to find ways of extracting if the effective models in a controlled way, and that is something that that will take, I think, at least as long in research as it will take to build the, the near quantum machine. In chemistry, it is called the the dynamic uh, correlation problem. So this is something we have to solve to make quantum hardware be really useful. And it's not something that I can do myself. It's what uh, the uh, whole, 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 whole uh, uh, the, 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 the community will need to work on ultimately. Um, just maybe uh, following uh, quickly on what you said, do you think that quantum computing would um, benefit from stronger um, links between the different disciplines across quantum chemistry, uh, physics, uh, or do you think that the networks are already in place? 
for the, for, do you mean for the algorithm development or for building the quantum computer? Uh, let's say for, for for applying quantum computing successfully, because you mentioned, for example, that um, yeah. you know, the, um, designing uh, accurate embedding models or test models require some knowledge about quantum chemistry. Yeah. I was working it. This yeah. was an issue. So I would say that it needs better links, but it's more that we need to make the various disciplines, like in chemistry, material science, and physics, aware of what quantum computers will be able to do. And then people like you can think about kind of how can I use that in my research. So it needs the information about th those uh, uh, the 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 capabilities that I may have in five years, in ten years, in twenty years, be shared with the, the various fields. Uh, thanks a lot, Matthias. Um, Nathan Fitzpatrick, would you like to, to jump on? Uh, hello, th thanks for the talk. So I, I have a question related to Hamiltonian simulation algorithms. So you mentioned phase estimation, yes. but there's been a, lo a lot of recent developments in the Hamiltonian simulation area, yes. and in particular, quantum signal processing. Yeah. I was wondering if you think that eventually quantum signal processing will become the dominant fault-tolerant Hamiltonian simulation algorithm. So what we've done in the last three years is we looked at the uh, Cupid. Okay, okay. So I need to quickly help my son get time on the computer for school because school is on Teams. And if I don't give him time on the computer, he can't go to school. Okay, that's done. Yeah, so the so near. Quantum signal processing is an alternative way of simulating the Thermodonians. There's a version called called cubitization, which we've looked at a lot. I showed the answers that said that if I had a quantum machine that runs at a logical gate time of 100 nanoseconds, I can solve problems in about two weeks. That was where what we assumed three years ago, we learned in the meantime, quantum machines will be harder to build. The logical gate will be more in the range of a microsecond. So there may be a, be a hundred times. Slower than the runtime of two weeks goes up to 200 weeks or four years. And so we needed to bring the, 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 the time back down. And we, we looked at your cubitization methods to bring it down. And we could get the runtime down by another factor 100 with new methods. So, yes, we need to look at your better methods. But then we started to implement the algorithms looking at problems of the connectivity and how would we code it up and how would we move data around and the runtimes keep keeping up again so we'll need to need 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 better algorithms again right now i'm not sure if ultimately trotter based methods will be better or the you know Quantum signal processing based methods will be better. I think it's too early to call that, but we need to explore all possible ideas. Thank you. Um, we have two last questions, Matthias. Uh, I don't know if you still have a little bit more time. Yep. I have time. Um, uh, I will read quickly the one of Stefano who asked me to read it. So. What can computer do for classical problems, uh, meaning not involving solving the Schrodinger equations, for example, like protein folding? Or in other words, why is it often said that quantum computing will help solve this problem, uh, assuming Google has not actually done this already? OK, so that is another one of my favorite topics. So, so first, so 
there are so statements like, for example, quantum computer can help with protein folding, can help with drug design, then often refer to Grover's algorithm. Because I said the problem with Grover's search is if I have to load the data, then there's a problem. But now when you say I apply, prote I apply the Grover database search algorithm to, to computed data, like the structure of the protein or something docking, then I don't have to load data. I can just compute it. And so it can actually do a computation of protein folding of drug docking and so on in a quantum superposition. And there, and then it can find the ground state with a quadratic speed up. So I have asymptotic quantum speed up in the problem. And that's what's often proposed to solve these types of problems. Now, there's a challenge here. And the challenge is complexity, theoretically, that's correct. Asymptotically, for long enough runtimes, the quantum computer will win. But that quantum computer, at the proposed clock speeds we have, and the sizes, we can kind of have to estimate now that on a single quantum chip, I can maybe do a few thousand floating point operations per second. Well, a classical computer can do about 10 to the 15 per second. So we found find that there is about a factor of 10 to the 12 difference in just the raw performance between the classical chip and the quantum chip. And if I have quadratic speed up now, that quadratic scaling advantage has to overcome the factor 10 to the 12 slowdown. And when you then work it through for a problem, you, you find that yes, asymptotically for large enough problems, the quantum machine will win, but the cost over time where quantum will start winning on this future sci-fi sci type machine is still years. And so with a quadratic speed up like Grover's algorithm, we will not get there in our lifetime. But this, and that's why I say you really have to look at problems with more than quadratic speed up. Those are problems like the, the, the chemistry ones, but classic ones as well, like for example, factoring is a problem. But we need to find more problems like that, that are classical problems and hard classical problems, but where I have more than a quadratic Grover speed up. Because the quadratic Grover speed up will not be realized in a time that's reasonable. It will, will, will not be practical. The other thing is, assuming Google hasn't done it already, yes, there's always the problem is, do we actually need quantum hardware to solve these problems or could I solve it with AI? That's also the problem for materials for chemistry and that's a very interesting problem that I would have worked on more had I not, uh, not neglected to join Microsoft. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, actually, the, the next question from Moshte is uh, some, somewhat related. I don't know if Moshte would, would like to, to jump on and ask your question. Uh, if not, I can just read it quickly. So thank you so much for the interesting talk. Do you think the chemical simulation at this stage might be replaced by quantum algorithms? Do you think computational chemists should move to this field? The answer is no and yes. So why no, it will not be replaced because whenever you have a classical algorithm that is good enough, you would use it because it's much cheaper to run it, you can do it now. You would only use the quantum computer where the classical algorithms are not accurate enough. And so these are problems where now you want to, want to use, uh, use, uh, use, use uh, the full CI methods in chemistry, and there we will be able to do more and better. Should computation chemists move to this field? Field, yes. Computation chemists should definitely learn about it, you think about it, think what we could do here, and help us prepare for the time when we have the quantum algorithms. But it will augment what we have and not replace it. Uh, many thanks, Matthias. I think we're going to finish on this very last question from Sabine. 
which might be a question a bit beyond the topic of the talk, which is given that there is a problem of overfertilization already, maybe it's better not to find a catalyst for ammonia. Um, That's a good point, but let me give a different perspective on that. But if we find a process that doesn't need a big, big companies to ship fertilizer because it has to be made in a factory, but if each farmer could make fertilizer in just the right amount, then you could just, just make just what you need. There's no incentive to ship you much. And that could solve it by just empowering every single farmer to use, to make their, their own fertilizer and use just what they need. I think that's the way to solve it. Remove the incentive for big companies to sell you more fertilizer. Um, fantastic, Maria. I think we, we are going to stop here this very long session of questions, which was extremely interesting. I think everyone really thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Uh, I would like to thank you personally and in the name of the TYC for taking the time uh, for being with us. Um, I was going to, I don't know if Arash Mostofi, uh, leading the TYC, or Carla Molteni, might want to say some final words here at this point. Yeah, happy to, happy to say a few words. Thank you very much, Matthias. It's a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you for joining us. There were over 240, maybe 250 people uh, listening and watching at one point during, during your talk. So it's really reached a very wide audience, not just in London, uh, but throughout the world. So thank you very, very much for joining us. And thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you for the, the, the invitation. And I hope that next year I can visit in person. Uh, yeah, we, 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 sorry, we also very much look forward to that time to come. Thank you. And I was just going to finish on thanking all the attendees, especially the one who are still here with us today for uh, joining uh, this event. And on this note, we're going to close uh, the TYC highlight seminar. Thank you so much.